Let's uh, take our hymnals, or I should say our hymn sheets, song sheets. And it's a great gospel song, Jesus Paid It All. And uh, we're looking at today the earthly occupation of Christ. We're going to look at that, but the work of redemption that Christ did for us was complete once and for all. And all of us here that know Christ enjoy our sins forgiven. Christ is our Savior. The Spirit of God indwells us. Heaven is our home. What more can we ask for? So let's sing all four stanzas, and uh, let's stand on that, okay? Hit it, sister. I hear the Savior say, We rejoice this afternoon that you paid it all because you loved us while we were yet sinners and that the Father accepted your sacrifice. Indeed, you are to him the son that pleases him the most. This is my beloved son. And we can say that you are our beloved Savior and that you love us and keep us and sustain us you forgive us of our sins. You strengthen us. You guide us as the great shepherd of the flock. That you lead us through our times in life. The times that are joyous and the times that are sad. You've taken us through times of sickness. You've never left us nor forsaken us. You're the great physician. Lord, we bless your name for the good report that we have from Anne. Thank you for traveling mercies down to Atlanta and back. And thank you, Lord, for the good diagnosis that she's cancer-free. We thank you, O oh Lord, for this. And at the same time, we lift up our brother, John Little. Lord, we thank you for our brother, for his love for you, and for this class. 
And we ask even now as he laid aside on the bed of sickness that you would visit him with the ministry of your spirit and comfort him and encourage him. And Lord, we pray for healing of this infection and that soon he'll be able to return home. Thank you, Lord, for his loving family and that looks after him and takes care of him. And Lord, we think of others in our congregation here that we thank you for. We thank you for Jeff Wedden and the progress that he is making in therapy. We continue, dear Lord, to ask that he may know a progress that will give him the full use of his body. We ask that you would protect him from falling. Lord, we also want to lift up Latrell and thank you for her surgery, that it went well, and that she is now in the next stage for therapy. And may she, Lord, persevere. May she not grow weary, but you would renew her strength. And two, Lord, we thank you for Jerry's brother-in-law who pulled through that long surgery. Now, as he recovers, Lord, we pray that he'll know of complete healing and be no infection. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for bringing us here. And we ask now, Lord, that you would open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things in thy law. And we ask, O oh Lord, that as we behold you as our Savior, the Son of God, that you would afresh and anew stir our hearts to praise for how great you are. And we ask for your servant that you would anoint him and direct his thoughts and that he may be a vessel fit for the master's use in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I trust now everyone's got a copy of the outline. And um, the outline is a little different. You realize that this is now our fifth Thursday in meeting. And your response and enthusiasm has not only encouraged each other, but it's encouraged me. And you know, I can't help to think that God is delighted to see us here and worshiping him and spurring uh, one another on the love and good works. Now, if you look at your outline, under Thursday school, October the 15th, you have a little timeline. And at the very top is the very first lesson that we considered, the moral perfection of Christ. Now, we're looking at the incomparable Christ, the uniqueness of the God-man. And Sanders doesn't begin with his birth. As a biography, most places and most books begin with the birth. But he takes us to the character of Jesus Christ. And if you remember, when we looked at that study, we saw the character of Christ as one that is perfectly balanced. He has no weaknesses. He has no strengths. Indeed, not only does he have a balanced character, but his character is bright and he shines forth. When he was on this earth, he walked among men and women, and they saw in him a man of true integrity, of true character, a man who was one of compassion and caring, one of power and one of compassion. We also saw that his character, a blending of the humanity and the deity that makes up the God-man. And so that's a good place to go because we leave each day in this class saying, indeed, he is the altogether lovely one. Well, we look down to this little timeline and you see the timeline, you see the top part and the bottom part. And from the moral perfection of Christ, we then went to the pre-existence of Christ. Pre-existing in heaven before coming to this earth. And we found that while in heaven, that he and the Father enjoyed rich communion, a real love, a bond of love. And that love was so great that they wanted to share it. And so not only did we find, do we find the Father and Son in communion, but we see the world brought forth in the command of our Lord. Remember, 
In Genesis 1 and 2, as Pastor Kevin has pointed out to us, how God commanded and the world came into existence. And every part of creation was followed by three words. You remember those three words? It was good. And so we find here in his pre-existence not only the communion between the Father and the Son and creation, but we see them also planning this great redemption story initiated by the Father, carried out by the Son when he came to this earth. But they were planning that before he came. The pre-existence of Christ, he never had a beginning. He never has an end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. And now as we drop below the timeline, we followed up with the incarnation of Christ and how indeed his birth is none other can be compared to. That indeed in the fullness of time, as Paul tells us, that God sent forth his son born of a virgin under the law born of a virgin, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Had Christ not been virgin born, then he would have had to have a sin nature, which would have disqualified him for being our savior. And if he had a sin nature, he couldn't atone for our sins because he would be on the same level as we are sinners. We can't compromise on that great truth. That's the greatest miracle recorded, the incarnation of Christ. And then last week, we entered upon the early days of Christ when he was a child and a teenager. Now, we looked at Luke chapter 2, and the first part of Luke chapter 2 talks about the birth of Christ, the nativity of Christ. But as we looked at it last week in verse 42 and verse 52, we saw two things. We saw Christ as a child. Now we have no scripture that tells us what he did as a young boy. There's nothing there. But we can come up with some thoughts that there were certain things that took place in the life of Jewish boys at certain ages. And we assume being raised in a godly home, a man who loved the Lord a woman who loved the Lord, that they raised their children. And you come to think of it, that was a large family. We think there's nine. And so our Lord was exposed in those early days to teaching from the word of God. He went to the school that was held in the synagogue, taught by the rabbis, and boys from five to 12 went every day, and they memorized the entire five books of the Old Testament that we call the Pentateuch. Can you imagine that? And they started with the book of Leviticus. Well, we assume that our Lord did those things. That was just expected of Jewish boys at that age. Now we do come to Luke chapter two, and I believe it's verse 30 something, that the parents takes him to Jerusalem to the temple. And there in the temple, he observes the Passover with his parents. They travel from Nazareth to Jerusalem. And on that journey, you know, they had a hymn book like we do, but it was the Psalms. They sung Psalm 121 through Psalm 132, the Hillel Psalms. And so you can imagine as they're heading up to Jerusalem, Coming to Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. So ascending up to Jerusalem, the temple points to God. It was a reminder. That's who they were going to meet in Jerusalem. Well, they observed the feast and then they headed back. All but Jesus. It was a day on the journey that the parents discovered he wasn't there. They had no reason to think he wouldn't be. He never caused his parents any problems. Wouldn't that be nice if that could be said of our children and grandchildren or could have been said of us when we were little? 
I gave my mother a challenge, I know. But um, he never did that with his mom and dad. But they knew something was wrong because they couldn't find them. And so they go back to Jerusalem and they search through where they've been. They come to the temple and there he is in the temple, listening, engaging with the rabbis and the teachers, asking profound questions and no doubt answering with profound thoughts. We know that because the response is recorded that the teachers were astonished or amazed at this 12-year-old. Now, being a 12-year-old boy was very important time for it was the time that they become a son of the law. Today we call it bar mitzvah. And this is when these young boys pass from childhood into manhood and all the responsibilities now of manhood is placed upon them. This is a big occasion. And so we left Jesus last week at the temple. And there's nothing more recorded in the scripture about his life until he's about the age of 30. So here's a question. What was he doing all of these years? What was he doing from the age of 12 to the age of 30. Remember when his parents found him in the temple? That his mother had approached him about asking why he was here and not with them? Remember his response? He said, I must be about my father's business. Was he doing his father's business from age 12 to 30? Or did he just start it doing it at age 30. Well, our God doesn't waste anything. And I agree with the commentator who said that Jesus was no less engaged in his father's business, doing his father's will during those 18 years than he was doing his three years of public ministry. He was engaged in his father's business during all of those years. Now, saying that, you have a picture on your handout. I'm going to thank Jenny Blackman. She picks out good pictures. And we have a picture here of Jesus with Joseph and Mary and three brothers, it looks like. Hard to tell if one of them is a girl. But um, anyway, we find our Lord with his father. And if you have your Bibles, Mark 3 gives us some insight as to what Jesus was doing from age 12 to age 30. When the people of the town saw Jesus after he ministered, the question was, is not this the carpenter? In Matthew 13, 55, the question was asked, is not this the carpenter's son? Of 18 years of Christ's life, we know absolutely nothing except what is contained in those two words, the carpenter. What a title for the Lord of glory. Think about it. What is the significance of God choosing for his son in his incarnation, the lot of a working man? Why did the Lord, who could choose any profession, any trade, any job, choose to be a carpenter. Think about it. He who is creator God, who made the heavens and earth, humbled himself to work as a carpenter with a saw and hammer for 18 long, tedious years. God ordained Jesus that he would be a tradesman, a common working man, working with his hands. I think there's two thoughts here. First of all, it is evidence of his humility, his condescension. In Philippians chapter 2, where Paul says that he humbled himself, the king of glory 
the Son of God coming down here to work in a sweaty carpentry shop with his hands with a hammer and a saw and a plane. That's one thought. And I think there's another thought tied in here with the word the carpenter. And that's this. It was our Lord's purpose to identify himself with the bulk of common people. As it was said, common labor was stamped with eternal honor. It acquainted our Lord with the feelings and the thoughts of the multitudes, of the everyday people, of what life was like. Seeing Jesus as a carpenter, we see him working with his hands, a tradesman, a working man. It reminds us of his nobility a work done to the glory of God. And I think that his willingness to occupy such position forever removes any stigma, acknowledging the common trade and the labor of the working man. If you look at this picture, you see that he is by his father. And like other Jewish boys, Jesus learned to trade and be an apprentice to his foster father. He became the village carpenter. Now that word carpenter does not only restrict, is not restricted to just using hands, hammer, and saw, but it also can include construction. As that our Lord and his father was involved in building homes or stables or whatever. There's another person in the New Testament who also worked with his hands and helped support it himself with his skill. Do you know who that I'm talking about? Paul, what was his skill? Tent maker. And remember that he used the skill of tent making to help supplement his income as he went around to the different towns preaching the gospel. So... We find here both our Lord and Paul puts a blessing or honors the work of men, mankind working with their hands. Think about this. Our Lord spent six times as long working at the carpenter's bench as he did in his public ministry. 18 years as a carpenter, three years in public preaching ministry. He spent much time in preparation. Preparatory years are important years. Jesus must be about his father's business and doing his father's will, which included 18 hidden, laborious, tedious years in the carpenter shop in the little town of Nazareth. And what did we find out about Nazareth? That it's a town not many people are attracted to. It's the town on the other side of the tracks. And one thing that marked his work is what we find in Psalm chapter 40 and verse 8. The psalmist writes this, and I read it for you. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Whatever Jesus did, it was a delight because he was doing it in glorifying his Father in heaven. And that includes working in the carpentry shop. We think about this now. Our Lord's leaving heaven, being born of a virgin, growing up with a big family in a two-room house, in a small little town that's not well thought of. He comes to work as a carpenter. You know, I think that it shows another trait of our Lord, his meekness. Just think about it. He is the son of God. He could have dazzled the people of Nazareth with the ability 
to do miracles. Instead of using a hammer and saw, his miracle, he could have used power to do that, but he didn't. He laid that aside and he used the sweat of his brow, the strength of his arm, and the hours of the day to do his work. I like what was said here. Jesus sanctified work, hard work, manual work, grunt work, mundane work, routine work done to the glory of God. Thus he has imparted to a life of toil both dignity and nobility. And so the first thing we see about our Lord's job or occupation as a carpenter is that he exemplified the dignity of work. Martin Luther said that everyone's vocation is a calling of God. Some of you, many of you are retired, but you have served in different capacities. We have nurses here. We have engineers here. We have folks that worked in the world of finances. We have folks that worked with computers. We have teachers. We have secretaries. And those are great jobs, and they're all worthy of respect. But also the common laborer, those folks that come and pick up our trash on a weekly basis, those folks that deliver the mail or packages, those folks that take the ditch and or takes the pitch, uh, pick and the shovel and uh, work alongside of the road clearing it up. That is dignified work as well. You know, my mom had a fifth grade education. She only went as high as the fifth grade. Her daddy died and she had to stay home and help run the luncheonette. And, uh, but one thing she able, was able to do well was to sew. She loved to sew. And so as mom got older, she got a job in a sewing factory. In her day, it would have probably been called a sweatshop but a sewing factory, and she got paid by piecework. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's piecemeal. Uh, piecework is that you have a bundle of things you get done, and then you move on to the next bundle of things. Well, mom's job in the sewing factory was to sew down the middle of the jacket here. So she'd get two halves, and then she would sew, bring them together and make one complete jacket. Mom worked hard. I think her take-home pay when I was growing up was about $75 a week. But she earned it. And there was a satisfaction there. And her place of employment was just as important as my dad's job when he was a postal carrier. He worked for the post office, delivering mail to people's homes. So our Lord's work as a carpenter puts the honor of hard work to mankind. He only backed up what God instructed Adam in Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 where it says the Lord put Adam in the garden, remember? To tend it, to keep it, and to work. And that was before the fall. So work has always been one which brings great delight to God's people, God's approval. Well, moving on, we see another thing that stands out about our Lord's occupation as a carpenter, and that is he exhibited perfect workmanship. The Son of God thought nothing of working in a carpenter's shop, sawing, using a plane, or using a hammer. He worked with his hands. He was a working man. He was involved in hard manual labor. What he did as a carpenter back in those days has completely changed to our day. He didn't have Black & Decker or the power tools that are made available to us. He had the hammer, the saw, a plane, and some basic ways of cutting with the use of a wheel. Sanders says Jesus sanctified work, 
hard work, and that he has imparted to life a toil of both dignity and nobility. Well, along that line, Paul writes to us regarding work in Thess- Second or First Thessalonians chapter 4. And if you have your Bibles, you want to ch- turn to that. It says here, but we urge you, brothers, to live quietly, to work with your hands, so that you may walk properly before else- outsiders and be dependent on no one. Well, it was said of our Lord that he did all things well. Our Lord's work, as well as his standards, were nothing less than perfect. In fact, in all things, including his work as a carpenter, it can be said of him, he doeth all things well. Think about this. Our Lord always worked. He worked before he came to this earth. Remember when in heaven, when he and the Father and the Spirit brought into existence this world. We looked at Psalm chapter or Proverbs chapter 8, verse 29 and verse 30, how he worked in bringing forth the foundation of this world. He spoke and he worked and he says it was good, not just once, but every act of creation he did well. In the silent years that we're looking at today, years from age of 12 to 30, he worked in the carpentry shop. There was a church father by the name of Justin Martyr. And Justin Martyr lived shortly after the death of John the Apostle. And through uh, oral communications, through firsthand talking with uh, John, Justin Martyr wrote this about the Lord Jesus that he heard. When he was among men, he made plows and yokes and other form, farm instruments. And you think about this in his earthly ministry, public ministry, when he went about preaching and teaching, he used to illustrate many of his points with a plow With a yoke, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly. The picture of those things that he made by hand in the carpentry shop came to be illustrations in the teachings that he taught. One writer suggests that, he said, there's one shop in Nazareth where benches were made to stand on four legs and doors to open and shut properly, for no second-rate work ever left his bench. Near enough was not good enough for the carpenter. It could well be that Joseph was the only carpenter in that little uh, town of Nazareth. And so he got all the business. And so if that was the case, then the demand was great. Would it be making plows or would it be making benches or would it be in constructing and building a home or stable? They were busy all the time. But more than just being busy, had to be the quality of the work. Now, if you ever watch Antique Roadshow, and I enjoy watching that, people bring their antiques and um, different appraisers will come up and they'll look at that piece of furniture and they can tell you who made it 200 years ago because of the quality of the wood, of the way it was made, of the way everything comes together and blends and joins together. Even though they no longer exist, their work continues on. And I can't help to think that what came out of the carpentry shop of our Lord was such like that. He did everything well. He didn't skimp. He didn't jack leg things. He gave 100% of his ability, his skill in producing what was called upon him to make. 
You know, Paul writes to us and he says, Therefore, beloved, whether ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And the emphasis is that we too are to give our very best in whatever we do. Would it be our labor of hands? Would it be the words we say or our service we render? We're to do it in the same spirit of our Lord. And that is our very best. And then, out of his occupation as a carpenter, not only was he being prepared for the public ministry that was soon to fall his way, but during those 18 years, he was getting himself in shape to handle all the demands that was thrust upon him in those three short years. I'm sure a lot of us can look back to our early days when we were beginning to work in the workforce, maybe even at home or on the farm. There were certain things we had to do, chores without pay. But then we graduated to cutting lawns and taking care of lawns uh, um, and houses and doing things along that line. We began to make a little money. But sometimes, or a lot of times, those skills that we learned and the um, different things we picked up in our training uh, in those early days helped to get us ready for what would be our life occupation. My mom had to do the sewing in the house, so it was natural for her to take on working in the sewing factory. And I look back in my growing up days, uh, I was surrounded by senior adults. And there were two seniors that I looked after for about eight years. I cut their grass, raked their leaves, wash their windows. And this one lady, bless her heart, she had hard wooden floors. And she had real thick glasses. She couldn't see well. Only when I scrubbed the, her floors and she could see where I missed. She, she always had a bucket of water and a scrub brush and octagon soap. You've ever heard of octagon soap? Brown soap. It's a bar about that big put it in the water and take the scrub brush and get that stuff, you know, get down on your knees and, you know. Now, I wasn't very successful in scrubbing floors. And then I would often leave too much soap on the floor. And then she'd give me a bucket of clean water to go over it and wipe up the soap. But unknowing at the time, being around Mrs. Houston and Mrs. Phipps and Mr. and Mrs. Fokoski, I was learning things to prepare me to serve you folks this afternoon. Learn how to get involved and understand folks older than me and enjoy being around them. And you know, in that light, our Lord, he met all sorts of people as a carpenter. People came to him and when he entered his public ministry, people would still come to him. Still come to him, not for benches and tables and houses to be built. They came to him to be healed, to hear the truth, to have compassion shown on them. And so back in the carpenter's shop for 18 years, he was meeting all sorts of people. But he was also building muscles physically. You think about it. Being a carpenter, you've got to have pretty good arm strength to pull in the wood and to cut it and to use the hammer with the force and the energy to drive the nails in. And you've got to have a keen eye to make sure as you plane that you're one line. Our Lord was doing that for 18 years. And then when he comes into three years of public ministry, you look 
at his life for three years, the demands that were placed on him physically, emotionally, spiritually, he could not humanly sustain that had he not developed the physical strength and physique to withhold or to withstand all that would come to him in those three years. You remember sometimes he would minister to the people and it was late. And what did he do? Well, he went up in the mountains to pray. And when the multitudes came to him, he had compassion in his heart and he couldn't turn them away. They needed him. Now, mind you, he was in his 30s. So when you're in your 30s, as we can remember, we have a lot more energy, a lot more drive. But the demands made upon him, do you know, in the three years he was in ministry, that he traveled by foot in three years over 2,500 miles. Walking, three years, 2,500 miles. It wasn't on sidewalks and paved asphalt roads. It was on rough roads with rocks and mud and dips in the road. And oftentimes as he walked, people would come to him. Well, he couldn't turn them away. And so in the midst of being hot and sweaty, kind of like he had in the carpentry shop, he ministered to the folks. So those 18 years, he was getting ready for the three years of ministry that would be his lot, the whole purpose of his coming. You think about it. We go by the clock, we say eight hours, five days a week. Anything over eight hours is time and a half. But that wasn't the way it was in the Lord's day. It wasn't eight hours. It was like 10 to 12 hours. There was no air conditioner in the carpentry shop in the hot little town of Nazareth. So when you put yourself back into that time zone and you understand the manual labor and the energy and the commitment and the quality of work that the Lord did, the Father in heaven was glorified, but he was also being ready to take on that next step. Where for three years he would go amongst the people. 2,500 miles, that's a long walk, isn't it, in three years? I do two miles a day on the treadmill and I think I've covered the world. But our Lord couldn't have done that if he didn't have the stamina and the energy and the physical condition in which to do it. Now, you know what I'm talking about. You think back when you were 30 and what all you could do. But now you're 39 and you realize what you can't do. But you see, the demands on our Lord those last three years were met and were able to follow through with because those 18 years he was getting ready physically and also getting to know people. Everybody in those days needed to go to the carpenter for work that needed to be done that they couldn't. They, many couldn't afford a hammer or a saw. Many couldn't figure out how to get things done. I'm sure if I was living back in those days, Carolyn and I, and she'd know better to ask me to do some of that kind of work. She'd just call for the carpenter to come and do it, you know. A lot of people were like that. They didn't have the means or the skill to work with their hands. So, we don't know all that went on during these silent years. If you look at your outline and you see that timeline, you see underneath the youth of Christ and the early occupation of Christ, you see it, it's entitled the silent years. We don't know what took place. We can only look into those two words, 
the carpenter. And being a carpenter, our Lord gave dignity, restored the dignity to work. And at the same time, he did his work that he was called to do with great skill and commitment. He finished the job. And that's important, isn't it? And during that time, building up the strength in his body physically to endure not just physical, but emotional. Just think of the people that came his way, the people that were taken over by demons. And the Lord had to deal with them. How about people that were sick? How about the demoniac of Gadara? How would you like to come in contact with him? Some of us would see him, we'd run the other way. But our Lord went and saw him and dealt with him. He was able to do that physically speaking, humanly speaking, to withstand the physical demands and the emotional demands because of being prepared over all of those years. Well, what are we looking at here? We're looking at the uniqueness of the God-man. And when you think of our Lord coming down to become a carpenter. Wow, what an act of humility, of meekness. Paul tells us in Philippians, he laid aside his um, glory and took on the form of a man and lived life like you and I, except without sin. It makes us indeed grateful that we do know the God-man. He who lived in the eternity past, who was born of a virgin, who never brought any disappointment to his parents, who was a faithful, hard worker. And now what we do see coming up is his public baptism. And that is the beginning of his public ministry. And the rest of our class will be devoted to his public ministry and how he ministered those three years. But you know what? How many of us have given any thought to our Lord's growing up years? But he did. Just like each of us. He grew, but it says in Luke 2 verse 52 that he grew in wisdom and in favor. May that be our continual encounter as we live each day for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for showing us your son and reminding us in his humili humility and his loyalty to you that he came to this earth and how he worked and how he was no doubt maybe the breadwinner for his father, for his family if his father had died during that time. Lord, we thank you that he is an example to us of a faithful, diligent workman. And Lord, you told us in your word that we're to be workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. So Lord, you called all of us to know you and to know your word. So Lord, may we have and understanding and hide your word and by your spirit to apply it in our lives and that we like your son would shine forth the gospel in word and in deed. Lord, these folks here, they're retired. They work hard all of their lives and they have shown forth what it means to give 100%, to sacrifice, to work and many times not be noticed for all the extra things that they did in their work. So now, Father, bless them this evening. And as we look towards the Lord's day, we pray that we would prepare our hearts so we may enter here to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.